Welcome to the Book Party Podcast. Join us as we journey into the world of books with Michael T. Prepare to be captivated by engaging interviews, insightful discussions, and fascinating stories. You'll discover new adventures and gain insight into the creative process of the authors themselves as they share their struggles and accomplishments. Now let's hear from Michael T. Michael, Michael T. This is Michael T. I want to thank you for being here this morning. To all our listeners, I would invite you to go to bookpartypodcast.com. That's bookpartypodcast.com. Hit that subscribe tab on top. Scroll down to the icon of your choice where you can find us on one of your favorite platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or Odyssey. You can download and follow us there, and please leave a review. Today, I would like to introduce our guest, Guy Morris, and his books, The Curse of Cortez, The Last Ark, and Swarm. Retired from a 36-year Fortune 100 career in software, high-tech, and global energy, Guy has also been a published songwriter for Disney Records, a patented inventor, a Coast Guard Carter's captain, an adventurer, and now an author of thrillers and AI expert guest. Since 2021 debut, Guy's Kirk's recommended books have also earned Book Tribe's best 25 books of 2021, Reader's Favorite 2021 Gold Award, and a finalist for Ian Book of the Year. Guy, why don't you take it from here, fill in some of the blanks, and tell our listeners about yourself. Well, thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a little bit of a um, enigma. I, I'm kind of a, a I have a, a kind of a broad, diverse background. I actually started, most people don't know, as a, a homeless runaway at age 13. Um, I lived on the streets of LA for a while. I worked with migrant workers to earn my, 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 um, to be able to feed myself. And a few years later, when I had the opportunity to go back to college, which I thought would never happen because I was always told that I was, um, stupid and, um, and I was functionally illiterate. I, I took the chance to me. It was a chance to change my stars and I wanted to change my stars. Um, I was able to graduate from college, uh, I with my undergrad with multiple degrees and I was given a full scholarship to go to grad school. I was accepted separately separate accepted into Harvard Business School because I had built a macroeconomic model that outperformed the, uh, the Federal Reserve and every other basically a computer or economic model in the nation at the time. That got me started in my career. Um, during my career, though, I wanted I was always inspired by men of the Renaissance. So I wanted to be not only a man of business, but a man of science, a man of arts, a man of music. So I really explored creative elements. Um, I wrote for Disney. I recorded several of my own CDs. I led a worship band. I produced an award winning webisode series um, that uh, ultimately brought the FBI to my home. That's a, another story for a little later. Um, but I have always tried to be an innovator, a thought leader, and try to stretch my boundaries as much as I can to reinvent myself as often as possible. Um, my latest, now I retired about six years ago from my career, and my third act career is now being an author. And what I try to bring to that is every bit of the passion and intelligence and hard work that I put in every other aspect of my life into being an extremely well-researched, well-read, well-reviewed, um, great author that will not only inform, but entertain. Fantastic. So in your journey as an author, did you take the journey, especially starting out, in self-publishing as an author, or did you take the journey as an agency author? Well, I started looking at agencies and that after being rejected a number of times and having written two books that were just extremely compelling books, um, I've never really relied on somebody else to validate me and, and being, you know, agents are always looking for, and, and even some of the publishers are always looking for sort of the trend thing. Um, if I, if I wrote paranormal romance and if I were 20 years old, I probably would have been picked up almost immediately. But being that I'm retired um, at an older age and that I'm writing a very um, 
um, highly informed, uh, intelligent thrillers. Um, that wasn't something that it was it was going to be easy to um, make it in that particular marketplace. Now, in most cases, once I started learning the business more, I've been I've started many businesses. I've, I basically put together top rated teams. And so I realized that most of what the publisher was going to do were things like hire a great editor, uh, hire a great designer, uh, get you into some catalog to get that basic exposure. But then they were going to rely on the author to do most of their own promotion and marketing. And I thought, well, gee, I can do all of that myself. I, I know how to pull together an amazing team. I know how to produce a top quality product. Uh, I've done it for years. And so um, I ultimately decided after my second book was written, Swarm, and it was so timely in, ele in the elements of the current politics of the time, which is 2020, uh, as well as the artificial intelligence issues that really weren't on the social public consciousness as much as they are now. I knew that they would be um, within a short period of time. And so I, uh, I was all my my beta readers and all of my family and friends were basically just forget agents, forget the publishers. You can do this yourself. Just get these books out. So I decided to go self-publishing. But as you noted, all of my books have been Kirkus recommended, uh, which is a gold standard in the industry of all the books in the publishing in that are published through the standard publishing uh, channel roughly 30% of them get a Kirkus recommendation and of that 30% less than 10% are indie authors like myself. So I feel like I've um, met that quality standard and, um, and the awards kind of also kind of speak for themselves. So you did the indie author route as well. I did the indie author route. Um, as he said, I, I'm kind of a multi-talented guy. And, and so I, I decided that rather than waiting or, you know, basically just getting hundreds of rejection letters from agents um, that I could prove myself and prove my platform and um, build that platform by getting the books out rather than waiting. And so that was my choice. Okay, great. Because the indie author route for a lot of people is really, really difficult to actually take on all of those tasks themselves, especially when it comes to the book cover. You know, that's a really difficult issue for a lot of people to get a really good book cover out of it. Well, and, and one of the things I've learned in my career was that I'm only as good as hiring and bringing surrounding myself with extremely qualified people who were better at me and at, at many of the things that needed to be done. So I went and basically found and hired a, a professional editors. I found a, a professional book designer who'd been in the business for 18 years. Um, with a lot of great credits to his name. He's actually out of Cardiff, England. So I have, uh, we have a, I have to communicate with him over the, uh, over the puddle. Um, but I wanted to find, and rather than trying to do it all myself, my view was this is a business. Uh, the publisher is going to invest in these things as well. So why don't I make that investment instead? And if I believe in my product, I'll make the investments necessary to produce a top quality product. And so I did. There you and go. Um, okay. I'm getting the investment back. There you go. Fine. Okay. When you are writing, take us to a point that you would consider your worst author moment. My worst author moment. Um, <laughs> uh, I, my, the first book that I wrote um, was The Curse of Cortez. And it was, uh, I was inspired to write that book. It started off as a short story for my son when he was like 11 or 12. The short story is called Paolo and the Shark. And The Curse of Cortez was sort of a follow-up to that story, but I wanted it based on real history, real a real historical mystery, real research. And so it took me about, actually took me 12 years on and off to do the research for that book. And I was still working in my career at the time. So I had a you know, professional career. I was working 14, 16 hour days. Uh, and so this, these were things, writing the book and researching were things I was doing sort of in part time. And so once I had a, 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 what I thought was a pretty good starting story, I hired a very expensive professional editor from Simon and Schuster. And I, I asked her to basically, I said, I, I think I've got a really great story here. There's an amazing amount of history and connections and mystery to this, this, this story. Um, but I need you to go through and sort of rip it up, uh, read me a new one if you have to, and give me a plan on how to stitch myself back together once you've cut me up. And she took about four months 
And um, when she came back to me, she, she, she had 44 single spaced typewritten pages of notes, things I needed to learn, <laughs> lessons I needed oh, to man. take. Uh, books I needed to read, formats I needed to understand, um, you know, big social, you know, sort of uh, the, the bigger issues that I was, I needed to kind of fix in the story. And then ev almost every single page of the manuscript had multiple notes on it. And my first thought uh, in getting all that back was, oh God, I suck. Maybe I should, I should think about a different alternative for my retirement years than, than, than becoming an author. And it took me about a week of licking my wounds before I finally kind of sucked it up. I said, well, God bless her. She did exactly what I asked her to do. And um, I can't fault her for doing exactly what I asked her to do. I, I, it just, I just can only fault myself for, for not expecting the results. And so I, I, I took her, her notes at heart. I, I went through every single comment, every single lesson, every single page. Uh, and it took me about a year and a half to get the book re kind of tweaked with all of that feedback incorporated after taking classes and reading books and doing all the other things I was supposed to do and learning a lot of the, the things that I, I should have learned. Um, you know, and I was, I was extremely intelligent, but most of my career I was writing PowerPoints and, and policy statements and, um, you know, spreadsheets and, and, and things that really didn't have a lot of the character arcs and other things that I needed to know. Well, that book was Curse Cortez. That was Book Trib's favorite 25 books of 2021. They call it Indiana Jones Meets Da Vinci Code. I've received enormous praise on that book, saying it ratchets up the um, suspense, uh, like a, you know, as, as along with as well as any of the best authors out there. And so, one of the hardest moments for me was basically being told what I really needed to do to learn how to be a credible author, and 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 taking that. You know, as I said, I took it a little bit like, oh, my gosh, negatively at first. But once I took it in a positive way, it was my worst moment that actually became the best moment in terms of. Um, well, at least she wasn't trying to handle your kid gloves. She did what you asked her to do. I, and I, that's what I said. I said, don't 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 try and save my feelings. Just tell me, you know, you're you're the expert. I'm the newbie. Tell me what I need to know in order to get to that level where I can have my book sitting right alongside a Michael Crichton, a Dan Brown, a Steve Barry, or one of the others that I admire. And yeah, God bless go. her. She did exactly what I wanted her to do. <laughs> it just, it just and took you me learned, a couple didn't weeks you? to kind of suck it up. <laughs> and you learned. I did. I learned. I took there it seriously. All right. Let's go to what I call an epiphany moment. This would be no matter what you were doing at the time, except writing, you're doing something else. You're driving, you're cooking, you're having a shower, you're sleeping, doing something else. And all of a sudden, a light bulb goes off in your head. Something about the book just goes, oh, wow, I got to write this down. I got to write it down now or I'll forget it or it'll fade away. Give me a moment like that. Well, it that moment i think probably relates and there are probably several of them um I'll, I'll just give you one of them that's an interesting story um in my career i one of the things i, I uh, was a leader on was i i implemented within my business one of the earliest stages of artificial intelligence when it wasn't even called ai it was basically called expert systems and so i had a lot of expertise around technology and and while i wasn't a developer i worked in the field and and was very um, well-informed about architectures and, and what technology can do. And I stumbled onto a short, it was one of those little short Associated Press blurbs at the back of a science magazine. One of the things that, you know, you see, and it's maybe like an inch and a half wide and two inches tall. And all it said was that a program had escaped the Lawrence Livermore Laboratories at Sandia. And if I knew anything, I should contact ex-professor or YFBI agent in charge of the investigation. That's all it said. And I got hooked on that little blurb. I cut it out. I taped it onto my monitor and I started asking myself a lot. Of, I mean, it just blew my mind. It didn't say the program. Now, by the way, the Lawrence Livermore Laboratories at Sandia is an NSA spy lab. Um, they created the Sexnet virus. They do cryptology. They do signals analysis. And so in my head, I'm reading that a spy program has escaped the NSA and they don't know how to find it. And, and I thought this is this is there's an incredible story here, 
and but I didn't know what it was at first. And so I actually spent uh, probably close to a year in my spare time trying to do research and, and do experiments to say, how does how, how did how did a pro spy program escape the NSA? It wasn't lost, it wasn't stolen, it wasn't corrupted. Their verb was escape. And so I kept trying to say, well, what does that mean? It means some level of intent or, or design. It means some level of intelligence or, or purpose. Mm -hmm. It meant that the program could move itself and then erase the log trails behind it so that the NSA couldn't follow where it went. And it was like a stealth technology. And so then I spent a little bit more time to try and figure out, um, well, what did the NSA want this program to do that it needed that stealth technology? And at the end of all this, I, um, I produced a quick webisode series that was only a few episodes long that dealt with this program. And the NSA sent two FBI agents to my door. And it was that epiphany moment when the FBI showed up at my door where it stopped becoming just me trying to imagine um, and me realizing that I had nailed it. And they were very upset with the fact that I had figured out something that they thought for sure was top secret. And they really hated my attitude because they were trying to intimidate me, but I was more like, yes, I did it. I figured this out. Come on, guys, admit it. You wouldn't be here if I hadn't nailed this. This is so freaking cool. And their typical FBI, you know, smiles, solid faces. This is not funny, Mr. Morris. Um, I, and I said, forgive me, but I'm thinking this is hilarious. My wife comes home during the middle of the interview and she pulls me aside. Honey, there's two FBI agents in our dining room and I'm pretty sure that it's not a social call. What did you do? And that was the moment I realized, you know, I have to write about this. I have to under, I have to find out more about what's really, how technology is really being used in our government and in espionage and in warfare and cybersecurity, national defense. I have to write about this story. And that program became one of the major characters in my books, Swarm and The Last Ark. And so that those books are exploring all of that, those years of research into really trying to find out what's going on and how it's going to affect all of us. Fantastic. That's really cool, though, especially when the FBI is the one that helped your uh, epiphany happen. <laughs> you know, if they hadn't showed up, I would have thought that I was just, you know, I'm just imagining this. Heck, heck if, I'm, if I know, I'm probably guessing out of my, my, my fanny. You know, but when they showed up at my door, that was like, okay, you, you just validated a year and a half worth of work, and God bless you guys. But And they just hated my attitude because they, they you know. For the they, validation, they yeah. To intimidate me or yes. figure out if I had broken any laws. I was like, hey, guys, you know, I didn't, I didn't steal anything. I didn't hack anything. I just, you know, I just, you, you, I don't know why you guys let us slip. And I showed them the article, and I said, you know, I just figured it out. You know, if you're really upset, hire me. <laughs> yeah, that's so, really cool. Okay, so today... What is the one thing that you're the most fired up about or excited about right now today? Helping the world. Let me, let me, let me phrase it this way. A number of years ago, Michael Crichton, who's an amazing author on every other level, every book he writes is phenomenal. He wrote a book called Jurassic Park that was trying to illustrate through a narrative the dangers of how when we combine our technology with hubris, pride and greed, how it can go wrong. And he was now he was dealing with DNA and cloning and, and DNA manipulation. My my mission is dealing with the dangers of artificial intelligence that people are just now starting to become aware of. And even so, um, the experts in the field are really you know, not talking about why they're concerned as well. So you'll hear Elon Musk saying, well, with AI, we're summoning the demon, but then he will go out and build another AI company and not tell anybody why he's saying that we're summoning the demon. And so um, I'm fired up about my series, my artificial intelligence, political, religious corruption series, because I'm trying to do what Jurassic Park did, which is lay out and put in a series of books because it's progressing is faster than we can, we can really absorb it the true um, life-changing, world, 
a course of the world changing phenomenon that we're calling artificial intelligence. And the, uh, some of the facts that most people aren't aware of, for a lot of people, it's just a cool tool right now. Oh yeah, it can make an image, it can make a video, uh, it could write a paragraph for you for school. Oh, it could lead to kids cheating. And I'm uh, way past that, really talking about the real issues behind artificial intelligence that most people don't know about, most people have never thought about, and even stumble some of the best experts in the field uh, where they can't see the future beyond three to five years because of how fast and how powerful this is becoming. Um, and they don't know what that means. Once we have a super intelligence, a thousand times more powerful and more intelligent than we are. And we're right at that doorstep. It's not future 50 years from now, 40 years from now, 30 years from now. It's within the next three to five years that these things are going to occur and will we'll likely change the world in unfathomable ways. And so I've been passionate about making sure I stay up to speed on my own knowledge, that I get informed as well as anybody in, in the industry, and that more importantly, how do I translate all that into an exciting, must read, got to turn the pages, um, fun narrative that people can't put down, but gets them rather than leaves them with a dystopic pit in their stomach, with characters, none of the characters they like, but having characters that they love, having characters they believe in uh, within a story frame that they really can't put down and leaving them with a more thoughtful, introspective um, perspective of what this means and more importantly, what it means to them and how it could impact choices that they would make with regard to their uh, priorities in their career, priorities in their lifestyle, priorities in their spirituality. Um, how how does this basically impact you as an individual? And and um, that's really where I spend a lot of my passion and my time these days. This is Michael T. And I thank you for being with us this morning. Please go to bookpartypodcast.com. Hit that subscribe tab on top. Scroll down to the icon of your choice, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or Odyssey. You can find us on one of your favorite platforms and follow us there. Please do not forget to sign up for our newsletter to get the information on our upcoming shows. Guy, we are getting ready to hit the lightning round. The lightning <laughs> round is four-pointed questions for four-pointed answers. Before you started writing as an author, what kept you from writing in the first place? A 14, 16 hour a day career. <laughs> that was a pretty consuming lifestyle. And um, you only had so many, so many extra cycles uh, during the week. And I was a pretty dedicated worker. And so it, it that got, I had a lot of thinking, but uh, it really kept me from doing a lot of productive writing. Just time. Okay. Share one of your personal habits that contributes to your success. There's an old saying that says, write what you know. Um, I believe that unless you're a genius that knows pretty much everything, um, write if you don't write what you can research and find out, and that's so you know it. Research on every aspect of your book, from locations to characters to character types to character arcs to technology, politics, religion. Every aspect of every book could use a benefit from researching so that you're basing your narrative and your characters on something real, plausible, and identifiable by the reader. Um, readers can tell when you're making it up as you go versus the kinds of books um, like Michael Crichton, like James Brown, like Steve Barry, where you know that they've done their homework to bring you a narrative that's very compelling. Do your research. When you're writing, what was the best advice you had ever received? Um, well, I go back to the, um, the Simon Schuster editor. I think the best advice I ever received was to, I, I think probably one of the influential things that she said was to read a book called uh, The Story by Michael McKee. And while it's written more towards um, screenplays, the, the necessary components of how a story has to move and how the pieces need to move with it and the character needs to move with the arc uh, was a very, very enlightening um, lit piece of literature for me to, to read. Uh, helped form my, um, my view of stories in general. 
And then I think probably the second piece of that was um, I took a master class from Dan Brown, and that was just phenomenal. All right. Well, share with our listeners and one internet resource that you use when you write. One resource. Oh, I use so many. Um, well, the master class program would be one, I would suppose. I think that because I think that's while it's high level, I think it, it, it can apply to every author uh, of every style. Um, the, the search, Google or Bing search, go find the information you need. Go find Google Maps, go find um, architectural plans, go find floor plans, go find everything you can about your story so that you're making it sound authentic and, um, and well researched. And just the, the ability to, the, the internet is such a phenomenal tool. And, and I'm proud to know that I was one of the people that helped build it in the very early days, but it has become this incredibly um, um, vast library of information that every author should be able to um, capture. Okay, Guy, we're going oh, to be yeah, entering the grant. For authors, if you want to be a, a, an independent author or self-published author, Readsy, R-E-E-D-S-Y dot com, has a resource for editors, publicists, book designers, book formatters, every tool or every subcontractor you would need to be a top-notch author. Author, You can find those people, those independent contractors on Readsy and contract with them and get multiple bids. It's an amazingly great tool to uh, professionalize whatever your story is, no matter how good you think it is. Uh, get other professionals involved in your team, make it a team effort, and you can find them on Reads. We're going to enter the grand finale. Why don't you tell our listeners a way they can find you, get in touch with you, follow your book, uh, then take some time and tell us about your book. Well, the easiest place to start with finding me and learning more about the books is Guy Moore's books.com. Um, there's... Um, I usually produce, there's links to buy links to uh, all the various places where you can buy the books. If you buy it on my, from my website, I can sign it and send it to you directly. Uh, but there's also fact versus fiction pages. There's uh, highlights and, and links to all the major reviews, um, including professionals like Book Crib, Book Life, Kirkus, and others. Um, uh, I had an um, a image library that I'm updating right now to make sure all the images are licensed, uh, licensed images. So that'll come online pretty soon, as well as some of the videos that were on there. But it's amazing, uh, amazingly great place to start. Um, I'm also on social media, LinkedIn, um, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook, and you can find me as Guy Morse Books in some form or author Guy Morse on all of those. I think one of my favorite books was The Curse of Cortez, not only because it took 12 years of research to really understand the true his history, archaeology, and Mayan mythology that went into the backstory of the book, but I was solving a true um, historical mystery. And the mystery that got me hooked and got me researching for 12 years was that in 1672, Henry Morgan raided the city of Panama with 36 ships and 2,000 men. And while he lost half of the men in the raid, he brought back well over a billion to a billion and a half dollars of plunder, 30 tons or more, and 600 slaves. But when he reached his fleet, he cheated all of his men and disappeared with almost everything on three ships that were never seen again. But Morgan survived and ultimately long story short, they made him lieutenant, they knighted him and made him the lieutenant governor of Jamaica with a garrison of soldiers. But when he had the opportunity and the power to go back for his billion dollar plus plunder, instead he went semi-insane, went into this haunted debauchery and burned his logbooks so the world would never know why he was abandoning a billion dollar plunder. Three years after he died, the whole city of Port Real sank into the ocean, including his grave. At the time, many of the locals said that they had been cursed by Morgan. I wanted to find out two things. One, what happened to 30 tons of plunder, 600 souls and three ships, uh, with the belief that certainly by now somebody had found something, even if they didn't understand what they found. And in fact, a guy named F.A. Mitchell Hedges did find part of it in 1911. And even he got away with part of the gold, but even he went insane and would never talk about how he found um, the treasure that made him rich. The second thing I wanted to find out was what happened to Morgan and Hedges, but mainly Morgan, that caused him to, to lose, to basically give up a billion dollar plunder he had already killed thousands of people to get. 
And so that journey, um, once I knew the location and once I figured out the location of where this had happened, um, I was able to start putting together the pieces and connecting the dots. And the journey was just an amazing journey for me that connected to an Inquisition massacre. That massacre ended a 2000 year pilgrimage to this island before anybody, the Spanish wanted to know why people were canoeing 50 miles into the open ocean to this island, what was special about it. And that island actually connected to the origins, uh, the real event at the heart of the Mayan creation myth and the Jobalba myth. So it's an amazing story uh, with amazing sets of characters that uh, deal with its modern day adventure. And so you're going to have family issues that deal with abandonment and um, stigma and trauma and insanity, family insanity and um, um, forgiveness and redemption. There's humor, there's romance, there's paranormal. It's an amazing book. I've even had a few screenwriters say they want to turn it into a film. So that's a great, that was a, a great book to start. It was a great beginning for me to start my, my literary career. Um, Swarm and the Last Ark are part of an artificial intelligence series starring that program, featuring that program that actually escaped and deals with a number of different scenarios that um, of how AI uh, could affect, affect national security, cybersecurity, the internet, um, uh, businesses, um, ec global economics, Ukraine, Taiwan. I cover, I go through a number of different things, the 2020 election, I'll deal with the 24 election coming up in the next book. Um, I'll deal with um, AI, um, experiments by CERN trying to deal with uh, mini black holes and how that could lead to a fifth dimension. There's a by One of the themes of the book is that this program that escaped has now decoded end time prophecy and done so with analytics, probability analysis, regression analysis to correlate things that were said to have happened, things that have documentedly already happened the probabilities of those events, and then building a regression model as to what could come next. So it removes the stigma, uh, the issues of dogma, it removes the issues of culture, religious, and other uh, racial and other forms of bias in that, that discussion, and really gets into more of a factual um, a analysis of um, does prophecy talk, really talk about how God will destroy humanity, or does it is it a warning um, as to how humanity might do that to ourselves? And so it becomes much more of an introspective type of um, um, a book. Um, I've received amazing reviews from uh, from Kirkus, Wowji, Reader's Favorite, Book Life, Book Trib, uh, that these books really are some of the most compelling um, books they've read, that they're, they could stand alongside any of the other major uh, political religious thrillers that are on the market. And um, I, I'm just... I'm just laying the foundation of where the themes could go in the next version of where AI is going to go, which is going to be within 18 months, we'll have a super intelligence, a thousand times more powerful than GPT-4. We're dealing with quantum technology that will be, it's already 10,000 times more powerful than the best supercomputer. And that's basically a growing by 10,000 points, uh, by over a thousand points rather. So um, it, it's, we're, we're, stepping into an era where, where uh, no one really knows how these events are going to play out. I'm taking my best shot and, and doing it as a narrative that people really enjoy reading and enjoy following the characters, the warm characters involved in, in this episode. So those are both great books. One thing I can tell you about The Last Ark that I think was most interesting for me was the discovery, and this kind of fed into some of the prophetic themes of the book, and many people believe that a third temple is part of that theme, but I discovered that there are two real Arcs of the Covenant um, that still exist today. Um, both of them are thousands of years old. Both of them have been used in temple worship. Um, both of them came out in news stories in the last two to six years that were never covered by the U.S. press. So these are amazing stories of how two ancient um, sacred relics have basically come to light and are being um, that could be used in basically a uh, politically corrupt peace deal in the Middle East. Um, one of them was stolen and sold on the black market. Another one that we know about because of a copper scroll found in the 1960s in Qumran and was decoded six years ago. So these are amazing stories where you'll learn a lot of history, you'll learn archaeology, you'll learn about technology, but you'll do so in not of a techie way, but much more of a action thriller kind of way, as a, like a Dan Brown novel, will take you through a number of different fast-paced steps where you're uncovering the clues of what's going on and how these things fit together. 
So they're, they're great stories. And um, I, 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 as I said, if you don't believe me, I, I encourage you to read the reviews. Um, and um, I, I, they involve a lot of deep research and a lot of thoughtful uh, processing of it. You caught all that, but um, I think um, I'm very proud of the books I do. I'm proud of the research I do. Um, I really believe that I'm, I can help people really understand the, the future of the world is that the near future that they're going to be encountering and hopefully have some thoughtful questions for themselves as to how they want to handle that. And, but do so in a really fun way that uh, if you like a top thrillers like Dan Brown, Steve Barry, uh, Michael Crichton, uh, uh, James Rollins, I think you you truly enjoy. And I, I've been compared to Robert Ludlum as well, Iris Johansson, Tom Clancy. <coughs> Um, and, and a number of other top books. Matter of fact, one reviewer said that the last arc was that if Tom Clancy and Dan Brown ever worked on a book together, it would look like the last arc. So if you like, if you can think of a, you know, Da Vinci Code meets Hunt for Red October, you'll, you'd enjoy it. Guy, we thank you so much for being here with us today, opening up to us, and I'm sure our listeners appreciate it too. Again, this is Michael T., and I thank you for being with us this morning. The listeners, We'd invite you to go to bookpartypodcast.com, hit that subscribe tab on top, scroll down to the icon of your choice where you can find us on one of your favorite platforms, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or Odyssey. You can leave a download and follow us there. Please don't forget to leave, leave a review. Book Party Podcast is owned and operated by MTM Legacy Publishing, LLC. This is Michael T. signing off. You must not miss our next episode as we delve into a world of inspiration, entertainment, and thought-provoking insights. Join Michael T. on the next Book Party podcast and experience a new adventure, a new story, and a complete immersion into the world of Pages Unveiled, Chronicles of the Writing Journey.